when I pour you a glass, you're really tasting what St. Petersburg tasted like that day that we harvested the honey. I mean, it's a really unique experience. So I think it's, I think it's worth that sort of cost. I'm Robin Sessingham, and this is The Zest. Citrus, seafood, Spanish flavor, and southern charm, The Zest celebrates cuisine and community in the Sunshine State. This week, our Honey Bees reporting collaboration with WUSF News has us tasting the honey-based alcoholic beverage, Mead. Dalia Colon does that research. The brewer says it's about the most local thing you can drink. And speaking of local foods, we speak with a Native American chef who says we should be able to identify and cook with all those indigenous plants growing right outside our kitchen door. Just don't call them weeds. Come meet us in person. The Zest will be doing a live taping of a conversation with honeybee experts It's Sunday, November 10th at 2 p.m. at Sweetwater Organic Community Farm in Tampa, and we'll have lots of different kinds of local honey for you to taste. Find all the details at The Zest Podcast Facebook page. Support for The Zest Podcast comes from Seitenbacher brand natural foods like muesli cereals, oils, oatmeal, energy bars, gluten-free fruit gummies for the kids, organic coffee, and more. Available in supermarkets, health food stores, or online at seitenbacher.com. Sean Sherman is a Minnesota-based Oglala Lakota chef on a mission to revitalize Native American cooking and culture. His cookbook, The Sioux Chef's Indigenous Kitchen, won the James Beard Award for Best American Cookbook in 2018. I caught up with Sean before his visit to the James Museum of Western and Wildlife Art in St. Petersburg and asked him how this focus on indigenous food got its start. You know, I grew up on Pine Ridge Reservation, so I'm enrolled with the Oglala Lakota, um, which is in South Dakota, on the Pine Ridge Reservation. And, um, you know, I grew up in the kitchens. I started working in restaurants really young at the age 13 and moved to Minneapolis um, and just kept working restaurants and worked my way up into a chef position when I was pretty young, like 26, 27. And um, a few years into my chef career, I just kind of had that epiphany of realizing the absence of any kinds of any kind of indigenous or Native American foods out there. You know, and I realized that, you know, you could walk around Minneapolis and find food from all over the world, but nothing that represented the land that we're actually standing on. So it was also eye opening for me to realize I didn't really even know that much about my own Lakota heritage when it came to foods. And I can only name a few recipes of what I would think would be true Lakota foods compared to knowing, you know, hundreds of European recipes off the top of my head. Right, because you said you grow in your introduction, which I loved, um, Uh to the book. You said you really, you talked about the kinds of food that you ate growing up, and it wasn't necessarily what you were now writing about in your cookbook, The Sous Chef. You said it was a lot of canned vegetables yeah. And government cheese. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I grew up on the commodity food program. Yep. So this was a so, kind of late discovery for you. Definitely. You know, and for me, it was just like you trying to figure out, like, why didn't I have that knowledge growing up when I did and really researching the history of indigenous peoples um, and really trying to understand what were indigenous foods, um, indigenous food systems. So for me, you know, uh, as we look at indigenous foods today, it's a knowledge of not only all of the wild plants around us and the different uses for those, whether it's food or medicine or crafting, but also the history of uh, Native American agriculture and all the different seed crops that were around in such a huge area of North America. Um, And just looking at the immense diversity of cultures that were throughout the areas too. So, you know, there's still 573 tribes in the U.S., 634 in Canada, and 20% of Mexico still speaks indigenous languages. So we look at indigenous foods from Mexico all the way up through Alaska, um, and that's our main focus, even though we realize there's kind of an untapped indigenous food knowledge on, on a global scale that sits everywhere where people have such a connection to the land and environment around them through all those food pieces. So you loved discovering all the different kinds of plants growing wild and their uses. You know, you might have 
<laughs> become a biologist or a botanist, it seems like, but you you went towards the culinary route. How, how did that happen? Well, I mean, just because I, since I grew up in restaurants, that was just my, you know, my role and becoming a young chef. But, you know, part of my experience with plants, uh, was, uh, number one, growing up on Pine Ridge and learning quite a few different plants from my grandfather. But then also right out of high school, I worked for the U.S. Forest Service in the northern Black Hills in South Dakota. And my job was a field surveyor. So my job was to learn all of the plants in the northern Black Hills. Um, so that, um, you know, that job came in pretty handy later in life when I started really researching the, the knowledge base that I'm focused on now. You know, what are you what are you really hoping to do by by writing about and cooking this kind of food? I mean, by by raising the profile of indigenous food, are you hoping to raise the profile of indigenous people or spread more knowledge about indigenous people? What what are you hoping to do? Yeah, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding around indigenous cultures everywhere. And I think food is such a great way to share um, the immense diversity of culture that's out there. And I feel like, you know, today, if you drive across North America, you're going to see the exact same menu across the board, you know, the same hamburger, the same sodas, even the craft beers taste the same. Um, Whereas if we had indigenous restaurants all across the nation, and you're able to stop at those, you would see, you know, every few hundred miles would be a different language, a different culture. Um, and people could really start to understand the true flavors of the regions and the land that we're standing on. Because there's so many, you know, biodiverse regions across North America that the indigenous cultures and indigenous foods really showcase so well. How is that different than, than just, say, the local food uh, farm to table movement? Well, the Western diet, you know, is really limited in the amount of produce and vegetation and plants that's utilized. So the typical American, you know, eats less than 30 plant species because they go to the grocery store and they buy the same stuff, you know, like tomato, avocado, strawberry, apple, lettuce, and people will stop counting in their 20s typically, whereas the indigenous diets, it's using this immense, immense amount of plant diversity around their particular region. Like plants literally outside their back door, whether they're coming from the trees or roots or leaves. And there's just like, you know, hundreds of plant diversity in the diet for indigenous diets. And it really changes from region to region. So it's really exciting to think about the landscape to provide us with so much more that the Western diet doesn't even touch. But how do you cook like that? I mean, isn't it <clears throat> tough to find all the different kinds of plants? I mean, I think it's fascinating. I would like to learn more, but that seems... <clears throat> It seems like a lot of work. It seems like I would have to really study to, to otherwise I'd be afraid that I'm picking something and putting it in my stew that's I'm going to it's going to poison me or something. It's just a matter of education, you know. So we should be teaching ourselves things that matters like the plants outside. You know, I always tease that our kids can name off more Kardashians than they can tree species, right? So sad. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but I mean, so we tell people to stop calling everything a weed because that just means you don't know what it is. So take the time to learn the plants and you're going to start seeing food and even medicine like all around you, like literally just steps outside your back door. Yeah. So talk a little bit about your recipes in the book because they're not complicated. They're, they're really... Um, just usually a few ingredients, um, and it's a it's a simple cooking procedure. It's not complicated, but the ingredients themselves might be hard to find. Especially, uh, it's a certain root. I can't remember now all the botanical names for things, but a certain root maybe that only grows in the prairies of central Minnesota. You know, um, how I'm living in Florida. How do I make use of the book? Well, the way we wanted to re- present it was, pe- was to get people excited and to think about the land that they're standing on and all the different uh, foods that are very particular to those regions. Because for an indigenous diet, you're not going to see the same, you know, foods across the board, which make, which what makes it interesting. It's like it's not much different than, you know, if you're in uh, Europe, say Italy, like, you know, from north to south, it's completely different foods, you know, when it comes down to it. And there's very unique flavors that come from very unique regions. And it's like that with these kinds of foods. It doesn't have to be homogenized. We could be celebrating all of these different flavors and these different pieces. Um, and again, like some of this stuff is like unique to a very particular region. And that's, uh, you know, chefs should be excited about exploring more regional foods and understanding what true North American foods really are. <laughs> 
And you did, though, give, um, I have to say, you, wanna, you did give substitutions. You did give us an out. So if we can't find this particular uh, exotic tuber, you did say, in, well, you could use lemon or you could use, ma- <laughs> uh, you know, uh, light brown sugar instead of maple sugar and things like that, you- which helps out a lot. Yeah, you can. But then it's kind of like saying like, you know, I, I really want to try Native American foods, but is it okay if we replace it with our European foods? <laughs> so it's a little bit ironic, right? <laughs> it is. But, you know, I mean, as much as I want to try it, I, you know, it's like, what's the best way? What's the best way for a new person wanting to try this? What's the best way to start out in whichever region they are? We're in Florida. So how do we find out? what our indigenous plants are and how we can use those in our food. Well, you just think about what's growing because you guys have a ton of seafood, obviously, because there's obviously a ton of coastline around you, right? So there's all sorts of uh, sea plants and, um, you know, seafood and shellfish and everything coming from the ocean. So that's a big part of it. But then you're also looking at, you know, just like what's been growing. And historically, you know, um, corn culture has been throughout such a huge area all throughout Mexico, Caribbean, the entire eastern seaboard. Um, So like searching out some of those indigenous seeds is something that we have done. So being able to find things like corns and beans and squash and chilies and sunflowers, um, pieces that have been grown agriculturally historically for, for millennia. You know, so there's a lot of bases that you already see in the foods today, you know, with like grits per se or um, bean dishes and things like that that come directly from indigenous um, historical backgrounds. So, I mean, there's a lot to explore and getting to know the wild plants and the the, the plants that grow naturally in that region um, just adds a lot of the accents to the food. So it's just getting people excited to explore, again, the regions that they're living in and the history of the regions and the peoples that used to live there. You talked about, um, wouldn't it be interesting if when you're traveling across the United States, you could stop at different indigenous restaurants and try those foods? Are you seeing more of that pop up since you started this whole project? We're seeing an immense um, amount of people really interested, especially the tribal communities across the nation, um, really getting into what's called the um, indigenous food sovereignty movement of uh, not just chefs, but academics and seed keepers and farmers and ethnobotanists and wild food people and harvesters and craft people. And there's just this big resurgence across um, North America in general for indigenous communities to really start to reclaim their true food sense. And we've been, you know, seeing this rise and rise every single year with more and more people. And, you know, for us to be a big part of that movement has been pretty amazing. And to be able to try to work with just indigenous flavors of your region Um, and to see so much growth and excitement out there when it comes to indigenous communities across the board. We really feel like non-indigenous peoples can really learn so much about, you know, these food ways and these food stylings and how to be really closely connected with the environment and the plants around us and the natural resources around us. Oh, absolutely. And just looking through it, all the things that are so popular in diets right now are just sort of like naturally occurring in this food. And, you know, there's no, there's no gluten, for instance, because you're not using, you're not using wheat, I don't think, in any of the recipes. Yeah, we cut out um, all your, you know, we cut out European ingredients just to showcase the flavors and the foods that were wherever we might be. So we removed things like dairy, wheat flour, cane sugar, even beef, pork, and chicken because those things didn't exist. And, you know, the, the what is North America for the most part for a long, quite a long time. Um, so it makes the, the food extremely healthy because indigenous peoples, before they were pushed onto Western diets, didn't have to worry about type 2 diabetes or obesity or heart disease or even tooth decay because of this extremely healthy and diverse uh, food base that people were utilizing um, for so long. You know, So we really believe that we can bring back and, and combat a lot of health issues, especially on impoverished areas, which are unfortunately a lot of the tribal communities. Um, and you know, just by eating traditional indigenous food, foods that can really um, bring back a, a stronger sense of health for the future. That's really exciting. And and you're right. I mean, a lot of the things that people are just now discovering, they can't tolerate. I, you, you mentioned dairy. 
right? Yeah. I mean, but I mean, it's already an, already an ideal diet and it's diverse because it changes every region you go into, you know, and it's fun to explore and it's just really healthy, wholesome food, which is why we kept those recipes really clean and really simple because it's just utilizing a few ingredients and letting those ingredients really be themselves um, and letting those uh, nutrients stay really dense um, to help us all along. And you feel it when you eat the foods, you feel so uh, um, invigorated, so... And you, you asked the question in your introduction, you said, you know, why isn't this the hottest diet out there right now? Because <laughs> it incorporates all this healthy stuff. Mm-hmm. And it's micro regional and you're supporting super local growers. And we try to support indigenous producers as much as possible. And we're hoping as we create more demand around indigenous foods and more awareness that we're going to be creating, um, you know, helping along a lot more indigenous producers to come into the market. People can uh, find and access these foods easier in the future. It is, I think, complicated, though, how you decide what's indigenous, because you even, you know, you talked about the fact that um, these people were traders, um, T-R-A-D-E-R-S. So, <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah. so I don't want any mistake there. So yeah. that um, they, you know, they would rely on foods from other parts of the country because they use those for trade. So they were cooking with things that weren't particularly native to their area. But but trade foods weren't necessarily what they were relying on. It was more things that they were able to trade when they had surplus and being able to, you know, add to their diets from what other people were growing. So I see. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's just, you know, it's just really important. But those foods, you know, we want to see them out there and we want to see more of it out there. And we want to see people have access to these foods down the road. But, you know, for us, it's not about just commodifying these foods. It's really about creating access to these foods for people. So you said your favorite food growing up, you, there was one traditional dish. Wojapi. What is that? Uh, it's just a berry sauce. So traditionally we made it with choke, wild choke cherries that were in our region. Um, and it's just something that, you know, I grew up and it was definitely, you know, still still around from the old days. And again, like we're going very far back in history because, you know, looking at the history of what, like Lakota people where I grew up, right? Um, when I was born in 1974, 100 years prior to my birth, um, all of my Lakota ancestors were still living on the plains as the way they always have because they didn't discover gold in the Black Hills till 1876. You know, so within within 100 years, less than even, so much uh, damage and trauma um, happened to Lakota people, which is why when I was born in the 70s, like this uh, information just wasn't available because we've gone through so much poverty and assimilation, boarding school situations that it damaged um, a lot of this knowledge base. So a lot of this work was um, trying to see what we have lost to be able to piece it back together. Some things, it's just interesting that the food ways was one of the things that just kind of had fell by the wayside. Yeah, and I mean, it's just because indigenous peoples were removed from their typical home area and pushed onto reservation systems and forced to be reliant upon government foods, which is why I grew up with commodity food programs, you know, but those are not nutritional programs and they have nothing to do with what our traditional foods are. So for us, it was trying to push back against that and trying to, you know, understand what are our traditional foods so we can start to create that access and start to know how to work with it in a modern way. And also knowing that our environment has changed a lot. So there's a lot of new species of plants out there around us. But instead of just trying to draw a hard line of only eating indigenous plants, it's more about using an indigenous perspective and saying, like, is this plant edible? Is it medicine? Can it be used for something? And trying to understand the true value of the the environment around us. Are you able to, do you ever run into old timers who actually remember some of the old recipes and ways of cooking? Yeah. There's a lot of elders out there in different communities, and a lot of them still carry a lot of that knowledge. Um, And it's just, you know, it's different from tribe to tribe. So there's a spectrum of uh, some tribes who have retained a lot of their food identity and a lot of um, groups that have lost almost all of it. Are people writing that stuff down or... I'm, you know, I'm in it's radio. That, Are we know, recording it? 
<laughs> yeah, right. And, you know, that's part of the work that we're doing with our nonprofit um, natives or North American traditional indigenous food systems and the creation of our first restaurant called Indigenous Food Lab is creating a place where we can record and we, where we can grow and really focus on indigenous focused education, um, apart from Western education, you know, so we really want to focus on things like uh, indigenous seed keeping and farming and ethnobotany and plant identification and all sorts of culinary applications and food preservation and history and language and being able to teach um, a lot of this indigenous education that's just not out there but also creating these restaurants that are able to provide the access and training so we can help others grow and help create more of this, but also becoming a central point for a lot of this knowledge for people to tap into so you don't have to search so hard to find all of this uh, information. Food just connects so many different parts of culture. Uh, it's amazing. It's very true. It's a cultural identity for anybody. You know, you think about your great grandparents' foods and uh, how much a part of that uh, of is, is your identity, you know. So for a lot of indigenous communities who went through so much uh, forced trauma in the late 1800s and throughout the 1900s, you know, it's really important to rebuild a lot of this knowledge around foods and also to showcase non-indigenous peoples the importance of the, and the differences in all these different regions and how we should be really celebrating indigenous of North America. So you, there's a restaurant, is that in Minneapolis? Yep, we're getting ready to open our first restaurant in Minneapolis called Indigenous Food Lab. And like I said, it's actually a nonprofit um, educational restaurant where we're going to be teaching classes, but the public will be able to come in and try it as a restaurant. And we're using that to work with the uh, tribal communities around us to help them to develop an indigenous kitchen in their own community to help impact a lot of the health and culture in those regions. And our goal is to open up indigenous food labs in cities all across the nation, whether it's in Florida or Seattle or uh, San Francisco or Chicago or Boston, Denver, you know, and each one will be a regional center point for education and food access. Sean Sherman, it's been a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you very much for having me. We continue our honeybee reporting project with a story about quite possibly the oldest alcoholic beverage on earth. Mead, an ancient drink made from fermented honey, is starting to pop up all over the place. It fell out of favor when people learned to make alcohol from cheaper fruit and grains, but its popularity is being helped along now by craft beer and the Game of Thrones craze. Brian Wing of St. Petersburg's Green Bench Mead and Cider says the brewery's small batch mead is the most local thing you can drink, made with honey from Green Bench's rooftop beehives. He spoke with the Zest producer, Delia Cologne. Mead is a beverage made with fermented honey. So beer would be fermented uh, malts and grains and cider you might be familiar with is fermented apple juice and mead is simply another source of sugar, this case honey that we ferment. Where does the honey come from? Does it matter? Yeah, so, you know, honey being, well, I should say water is the primary ingredient because it makes up most of the volume, but everything about the mead comes from honey. All the character and, and everything interesting comes from the honey. So it's, it's vitally important that you have great honey. And, and we source ours from a couple different locations, right? Some here in Florida, places like uh, Winter Haven, around that area, some, some of the citrus groves there, we get a lot of really great orange blossom honey uh, between here and Plant City. And then when we want to go further afield, we can, we can grab sources of honey like raspberry honey or mesquite honey or buckwheat, things you can't get in Florida. We go all over the country or the world for that honey. But, of course, always finding from quality sources, you know, we want to know where that honey is coming from, that it's unadulterated, it's not corn syrup or that sort of thing. And then uh, we actually have a couple hives on the roof where we source some of our honey as well. Now, that's a very small amount of honey. We make very small, limited batches with that. But that comes straight from green bench apiaries on the roof of the building. You have your own apiary. Yeah. Of right. course you do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Wow. Now, does the taste of the mead change depending on the taste of the honey you're using? Yeah, 100%. I mean, a lot of the recipe uh, formulation that, that I go through starts with a uh, honey or, or some other, you know, maybe a fruit or something that I think is interesting. And I want to pair that well with, you know, honey or a different fruit or whatnot or juice or whatever the case may be. I mean, the, the honey on the roof here, not only does it taste different than the orange blossom honey I can get or raspberry blossom honey or any of those you could name, it changes from season to season. So spring will taste different than fall from the honey from in this, the same spot up here. Because of course, 
different flowers, different trees and shrubs are blooming at that time. The bees are getting their, their nectar from different sources, and that has an incredible impact on the honey. So, it's, I mean, it can vary from month to month, let alone variety to variety. Yeah. Wow, always something new. So how would the customer distinguish orange blossom mead from raspberry mead? Are they labeled the same, or how do you distinguish the different seasonal honeys? Yeah, so w- when, whenever we have something either bottled or on tap here at Green Bench, we're really clear about what's in there, because we're proud of the ingredients. So we want to make sure that you understand what type of honey it is, what fruits or other adjuncts might be in the mead or cider, for that, for that matter. And, uh, and so we'll, we'll make sure to highlight that for you. And then as far as, you know, when you come in and taste, anybody who's an experienced mead drinker will start to get uh, you know some understanding or at least be able to fairly good guesser at what kind of honey is in there but there's so many varieties of honey that nobody can be an expert you talked about how experienced mead drinkers might be able to distinguish some of those subtle changes in the honey how about for the mead newbie what does it taste like does it taste like anything we've ever tried before i've never tasted mead so i'm excited sure so no i mean it although depending on what kind of mead it is and what else is in there there might be some resemblance to you know certain wines you've had Uh, the darkest timeline is one of our most popular meads here and it's a mead with orange blossom honey and then it's got a whole lot of fruit and that's black currant blackberry and raspberry and so it's it's kind of this berry bomb but it's fermented out semi-dry and so when you drink it it really tastes like a semi-dry red wine. There's a lot of things in common with that, from the fruit mostly, right? And then the addition of the honey, you're going to get things like, um, you know, especially orange blossom presents. Not When you hear orange blossom, don't think citrus. Think the actual flower itself, you know, the actual floral note. You'll get that a, a ton of that from orange blossom honey. And so when you start drinking that, and, and I tell you it's orange blossom honey, and you're going to taste this, this, and this, and you taste it, you're going to start picking up some of those uh, flavors and aromas to familiarize yourself. But mead is an entirely different animal than beer or, or wine, for that matter, or cider. It can be as sweet as you want. It can be as dry as you want, just like a lot of wines can be. That's all down to how it's fermented and how the ingredients you know, how it's put together by the mead maker. And so there's an incredible amount of variation available. But the truth is that in Florida, there's not a ton of it available yet. It's just starting to make its way into Florida, really becoming popular. And so right now you have a limited set of options to choose from. But as you see more mead come in and more great mead makers show up and start producing in Florida, you'll, you'll see how wide and varied the selection can be. Mead is having a moment. What do you think it is? Well, it, I mean, it is. There's a, it's, it's sort of a renaissance or, or maybe a rediscovery because there's some evidence to, to suggest that mead is probably the first alcoholic beverage that we as humans ever consumed. Because it doesn't require knowing how to grow grapes. It doesn't require knowing how to grow apples or, or any of those sorts of things, or grains for that matter. Honey would have been occurring as long as humans were, even longer, really. And fermenting it is a fairly simple process. So it's, it's likely that it was the first thing we drank with alcohol in it. And it was quite popular in uh, Europe. You know, this is, goes back a number, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years ago. It's quite popular there. But the truth is that honey is a very expensive ingredient. And so when supplanted by other alcohol sources uh, that took grains or whatnot, were much cheaper to produce. And then on top of that, spirits, at, when you start distilling, you know, they couldn't afford honey. And it sort of fell by the wayside. Well, it's starting to be rediscovered now for a couple of reasons. One is just that there's always been a a small movement of mead makers in the U.S., and, and that's picked up some steam. There's some element of pop culture, you know, Game of Thrones and things like that, and the word mead being thrown around that people start saying, what is that? I want to try it. So there's this kind of combination of things of people you know, rediscovering it or maybe discovering it for the first time, some pop culture that's getting people interested in that idea. And then just we're in a kind of a situation where we went from maybe 100 mead makers around the country at the most a few years ago to three or four times that many now. There's meaderies opening all over the place. So it's really exploding right now. So we're kind of at a good spot to, to sort of just, you know, it's catching fire right now. Yeah, absolutely. You're riding that wave and you're doing it very well. You mentioned that honey is expensive. And especially if it's real honey, there's a lot of fake honey out there, but I think we've all watched enough documentaries to know the difference between real and fake honey. And people are really interested in where their honey comes from. Like I will make a special trip to the farm stand in my neighborhood to get what I know is real local honey. So how does the price compare to that of beer? To give you an example, oh, I don't know. Let's say we're making a 300-gallon batch of beer over on the other side of the building. And that may cost, for ingredients, may cost $500, $1,000, somewhere in the neighborhood for grains and hops, depending on recipes can vary wildly. Whereas when I'm making a a similar batch of mead, 
By the end of the day, I'm putting maybe seven or eight thousand dollars worth of honey into a batch of me. I mean, it's it's on a, it's a exponentially more expensive than producing beer. Beer you could have for pennies on the ounce, and that's just not going to happen with honey as expensive it is as it is. It's a I mean, it really is a a premium ingredient and commands a, a serious price. But when you think about what goes into making a pound of honey? Oh, the stats aren't at my fingertips right now, but when you think about a worker bee you might produce a quarter of a teaspoon of honey in their lifetime. So you're talking about a pound of honey requiring uh, visits to thousands or tens or hundreds of thousands of flowers by bees. It's an extraordinarily intense process for them. So we're reaping the benefits of that. It's a very expensive product to buy, uh, but that's okay. We think it's worth the effort and certainly worth the cost to get quality honey because you could get cheaper if you wanted to. But uh, like you said, you may be dealing with some questionable source there. Why is it worth it? Is it that good? Is mead that good? Yes, absolutely. And um, I think certainly people are willing to pay the money for that. So that bears out pretty easily. And it's a really interesting thing to drink. And uh, in the case of things like our honey up on the roof, you know, when I make a batch with the honey from the roof and water from St. Pete, I might bring in yeast from, you know, from somewhere else, commercial yeast. But you're really talking about kind of the most hyper-local alcoholic beverage you can conceive of, right? We can't do that with beer. We have to go out for hops or grain out of the state or, or whatnot. Uh, and same for cider because we don't grow apples here, right, in Florida. And so when I pour you a glass, you're really tasting what St. Petersburg tasted like that day that we harvested the honey. I mean, it's a really unique experience. So I think it's, I think it's worth that sort of cost. Well, I think we need to taste it. Absolutely. Let me get you some bottles. Okay. So what are we trying today? So the first thing I'm going to sample for you here is called the Darkest Timeline. This is one of our most popular meads. And this is the one I was talking about earlier that, that is orange blossom honey, locally sourced, along with black currants, raspberries, and blackberries, right? So it's kind of a berry bomb. It's about 14% ABV, so you're talking wine strength there. And then it's fermented out semi, I'd say semi-dry, so it's not going to be overly sweet, especially for a mead, but it comes out as a nice, almost kind of like a red wine character. You'll see what I mean when you get to taste it. Cheers. Cheers. Mmm, describe the smell for me. Well, I mean, you, you smell this dark, these dark berries, right? Uh, the, the black currant, especially. You can smell it. It's super dark, super rich, jammy, right? Liquid jam. Yep. That makes a lot of sense. Not quite as sweet as jam, but really enjoyable and satisfying. It's a great expression of that fruit. The orange blossom honey is there in terms of a citrus floral note to it. If I made the same mead again with a different kind of honey, it would be an entirely different experience. So, I mean, it's, it, it really does impact that flavor. Okay, now what do you have here? Okay, so this is the last batch of what we call the edge because we're in the edge district of St. Petersburg. Now, this is the mead that's made with strictly with the honey from the roof of our building. So this honey was harvested in 2017 in the fall and then fermented out at the beginning of 2018, and then just, just sat for some age. Sometimes that, you know, depending on the mead, sometimes they just need some time. And so that one had sat for maybe about a year before I was really happy with it. But it will capture, you know, what the bees were collecting in the fall of 2017, which for us tends to be, we call it wildflower because we don't actually know for sure what they're collecting. So that's just kind of the catch-all term. But uh, when you're familiar with the honeys available in the area and the, some of the nectar sources, you can taste... Uh, things like palmetto very clearly in this honey you can taste mangrove which you know these bees will travel maybe a two or three mile radius away from the hive to collect and so you know from pinellas county you know you can go two miles in each direction and you'll find mangroves you'll find uh, palmetto all over the place down uh, in st petersburg here i mean uh, you know and then of course all the flowers that are around the city or in people's gardens or whatnot anything they collect yeah okay i don't think i've ever tasted mangrove but let's do it yeah. give it a pour So you'll notice the color on this is, is super dark, super uh, like a dark amber, deep, deep gold. And again, this is just water and honey. So what you're getting here is strictly the honey that's contributing the color and the flavor in this one. And, you know, St. Pete water, but that's, we, we filter our water. So there's not much, not much contributing there, but super dark. This is going to be sweeter than the, the darkest timeline. It's left with more residual sugar. You don't have the acid and tannin from the berries to counteract. So it's going to be a much sweeter mead, but you're going to get like a caramelly dark sweetness from this. That caramelly dark impression is, is a lot from the mangrove honey from the palmetto. Both of those honeys, you can, you know, if you buy a bottle locally here of those honeys, you'll see what I mean, how rich and interesting and, and expressive they are. And the, the edge mead, I think, really helps highlight that. And so again, 
This is just the one batch from fall of 2017. Now, if I did a batch, and I, I mean, we've got more coming down the pipeline uh, of even spring of the next year or fall of the next year, they would be different. They would, they're just never going to be one that tastes exactly the same. It's, it's a time capsule. Yeah. Well, I'm honored that you uh, cracked Absolutely, it open for yeah. me, cheers. so cheers. Right. Wow. You're yeah. right. It's not sweet. For something that's honey and water and honey kind of amber colored, I expected it to taste like you know, a, a teaspoonful of honey, and like, it doesn't. Yeah, sure, like a, a syrupy, cloying sweetness. You know, I, as the mead maker, can control that through the process. Uh, and so mead, a lot of people think mead, fermented honey, it's going to be really sweet. I don't want it sticky sweet. And, and there are meads out there that are super sweet, and people love those as well. But I can create a recipe in a way and choose the right yeast and the right process uh, where I can keep as much or a little, as little of that sugar as I like. You really got to take a, a, the frame of reference like wine. How many varieties of wine and styles of wine there are. You can, you can find any, you know, something for everybody in, in wine. Mead can be that way too. Yeah, I'm tasting the alcohol more in this one. Is that, is that accurate? It's funny. They're both about 14%, but, you know, again, that sweetness helps kind of lend to the, the booziness of this one. And this definitely is kind of a boozy after dinner dessert wine sort of thing, right? Rather than, than filling up a six ounce glass and drinking it. I mean, they're both heavy hitters and, and meads usually is. But uh, it's funny how the berries, the, I think the acidity from the berries, uh, that tannin again, help kind of you know, just balance all of that out with the edge. There's nothing there to hide that. It's going to be a little sweet on the palate. It's going to be boozy and rich and dark and complex in its own way. That was Brian Wing of St. Petersburg's Green Bench Mead and Cider speaking with the Zest producer, Dalia Cologne. Don't forget, we'll be at Sweetwater Organic Farm in Tampa on Sunday, November 10th. Come on out while we tape our podcast and try some delicious local honey varieties and try out the recipe for a honey-soaked baklava-style croissant. It's on our website, thezestpodcast.com. I'm Robin Sussingham. Dalia Cologne and I produce The Zest with help from Megan Tremble, Mark Hayes, and Craig George. The Zest is a production of WUSF Public Media. 